All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from, yes, yet again, a back to being a sunny San Diego after the rain. Uh, we've had a lot of rain recently, pretty unusual, but there you go. And today I am delighted to be joined by Scott Prendergast, who is in uh, just outside Philadelphia on the East Coast. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing fantastic, John. Thanks so much for having me on your show today. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. And Scott is a professional, inspirational speaker, a mental health advocate. Uh, Scott speaks about the importance of acknowledging mental health in society and encourages techniques to overcome the everyday mental obstacles that hold us back in life. Uh, Scott travels across the country speaking to audiences ranging from high school students to adults while sharing his own story of hope and resilience in learning to overcome depression. And that's what we're going to talk about today is just is mental health. And I think actually um, depression is a good place to start, um, Scott, because I think oftentimes, I mean, especially in young people, and that is uh, people don't recognize the signs of depression and adults, you know, the adults in their lives don't always recognize the signs of depression and just think it's OK, let's just get this person out of a funk. Um, so it can be really it can be really hard. So um, what are some of the ways that you you know, what are some of the identifiers or things that people should be looking out for either in themselves or in others? Sure. That's a great question, John. I mean, it's something that comes up a lot, too, because one of the big things we see is people don't understand the difference between being sad and being depressed. And we have to understand that they are two separate things. Like when you are sad, that doesn't always mean you're depressed. But at the same time, sometimes it, when you feel like you've been sad for a while, it could be more than just a few down days and it could be actual depression. Right. So one of the things that we want to look out for in ourselves and our friends and our family is we want to pay attention to the longevity of that feeling and we want to pay attention to the the severity of that feeling. Now, what I mean by that is like, look, we all had down days. We all know what it feels like to be sad. You live this life. That's part of living it. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. But what you want to pay attention to is if that sad feeling, that feeling of hopelessness isn't just for a day or even a week or even two, but it's prolonged. And if you see that feeling of sadness interfering with your ability to function and do everyday tasks, then that's when it's probable that we have something more going on here than just a few down days or as they call it a passing blue mood right mm -hmm. so one of the really things that i think above anything else is we want to make sure that we're identifying these feelings of sadness the feelings of hopelessness that loss of interest that drastic change in personality when we see some things like that in ourselves or others and it's lasted for a few weeks a few months and it's interfering with our ability to do everyday tasks that's where we're looking at depression as opposed to just dealing with some difficult patches in life. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, uh, and I think the other, the other part of it then is how, how would you advise parents or employers, managers, whatever, how would you advise them to reach out in a way let's, let's face it, right? If I come, if if I have, uh, if I have a broken leg, right, you can see it and you can go, okay. And as I would say, like, nobody's going to say, oh, well, John, you must have very weak bones or think of me differently. Oh, yeah, be careful of him. He's got weak bones. Um, but with mental health, it's like when people start to say, oh, you know, I'm having these issues, they fear that they're going to be perceived as weak. And to be perfectly honest, the people who they're telling often don't have the tools to understand and they start thinking oh looking at you very very differently all of a sudden and and, and being almost like afraid if you like yeah yeah and i'm sorry I, I got cut off for a little bit there but i heard the majority of your question and i think what what we see in today's world is we've come a long way but there's still a huge stigma attached to talking about mm -hmm. mental health challenges and if somebody says that they're dealing with depression or severe anxiety or ocd or bipolar your everyday typical person is going to look at them through a different lens, which yep. isn't right. And the reason mm -hmm. that we want to try to break that is that so we can help to normalize these conversations and help people to realize, look, this is something that every human is going to deal with at some point in their lives in some type of capacity. And there's nothing wrong with that. So unfortunately, we're still living in a society where people feel like they can't share that. They can't openly talk about it because they're, you know, afraid of being viewed in a different way because of that stigma that still exists. Now, one of the ways that we can combat that 
in a way that we can help others to feel comfortable to share this stuff is by really just validating their feelings. Look, you, you may hear somebody say, hey, I'm dealing with depression, and they tell you why. And you may think, my goodness, okay, there's no reason to be depressed over that. Right. Fair. But what you have to understand is that everybody's case is different. Everyone's circumstances are different. And how people interpret the events of their life is different. It's not the same for everybody. So what seems like a little small little mound for you might be a mountain for somebody else. Now, instead of judging and instead of passing you know, harsh comments on that, we want to just validate it and say, hey, look. You, know, you have every right to feel that way. Thanks for sharing. You know, I might not understand it, but I'm glad that you shared that with me. And this is a space where we can talk about it. Now, I'm not saying you have to go post on social media and say, <laughs> everybody feel sorry for my friend. Come yeah. on now. That's not going to get us anywhere. No. But just sharing that validation piece is huge for somebody who's dealing with a mental health challenge because they feel like what they're feeling in that moment isn't valid. So if we as friends, coworkers, family members, can validate that feeling, that's going to help that person take one step forward towards being able to work through that mental health challenge, whatever it might be. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think I think the other part, too, is people overlook sometimes is, yes, it, it, it may be a, a mental, you know, health challenge, but just like other physical ailments. I mean, if your synapses aren't firing properly, if you're not, uh, uh, you know, that can cause you know, depression, that's something that can, you know, can be, um, you know, fixed through through medication or, or whatever it is. So there are there are real things that are happening. But I also think the the other part of it is uh, I like your you know piece of advice about validating, validating, but but not trying to diagnose or treat. Right. You know, because we're not qualified to do that. And I think sometimes people think, oh, well, I'm not going to tell you if it was a physical ailment. Clearly, I'm not a doctor. But when it comes to mental health, like we're, we're full of advice. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. We are. We are full of advice. And I think it comes from a good place. And it's good that sure. people are willing to want to help. But at the end of the day, if someone's dealing with a legitimate mental health challenge, they need to get that professionally diagnosed. And that needs to be something that they can get professional advice for so they can then take the next proper steps. Now, somebody could help you to get along the path to finding somebody to give you that professional advice, I think is great. Because if we just start taking advice from anybody, no matter how great of intentions it is, it can really make things worse and can confuse people and, and spiral them into a, a deeper place within that challenge that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And and I think also uh, also today, Scott, is we're we're dealing with a very strange world that we live in, and obviously, I mean, I feel this particularly for for younger people, um, with social media, with you know TikTok, with everything, you know, where where we're seeing children who are so addicted, like uh, who are getting their dopamine hits off of ticks, zombie scrolling on TikTok, mm -hmm. um, that this is impacting their mental health, and I think, you know. Uh, as parents or as employers young of young adults we we have to be able to help i think help guide them a little more because i mean other, just leaving them alone with their phones isn't the way to go yeah you're so right i mean it's a serious problem in today's day and age i think there's a lot of good things that can come from social sure. media sure but there's a lot of problems that could come from it too. Mm -hmm. And addiction is a word that people don't want to talk about because when you say addiction, much like with mental health, there's a stigma that comes with it. But the reality is we are seeing younger and younger kids who are literally addicted to screen time. They don't know how to function properly without a phone in their hand. They don't know how to carry on a conversation. They don't know how to go about dealing with everyday issues without referring or using their phone to be a part of that. And that's an addiction and that's a problem, right? So I think one of the things that's really important to do, whether you're dealing with kids or young adult employers and young adult employees in the workforce is realizing, look, we've got to learn to set boundaries here. Okay. So maybe that means in your office, if you're working in the office right now, it could be like, hey, look, the first uh, you know, 20 minutes after lunch, we're allowed to see the phones out. After that, I don't want to see them the rest of the day. Or creating a space where, yes, you're not making them feel completely smothered where they can't use it, but setting that clear-cut boundary, not only for you so you can get those productive results, but also for them so that they don't just mindlessly, as you said, zombie scroll, get off task, and lead to all other different issues as well, right? So limiting and finding those boundaries and making them clear and defined is super, super important with being able to kind of work through that and not allowing somebody to just go down that rabbit hole of mindlessly scrolling, which then can affect our thoughts, feelings, and actions and take our day in a whole different direction. And we don't want that to happen either. 
Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, if you had a different addiction, I mean, if you saw somebody sitting at their desk, you know, necking beers all day long, you'd be, you know, you'd immediately go, oh, here's a problem. But we we ignore that, you know, we just assume they're doing whatever they're doing. Um, and it can be extremely, you know, destructive. Um, so um, you, on your own experience, uh, you know, your own experience, Scott, like what was what was pivotal for you in being able to reach out and engage with people and, and, and start your journey to recovery? That's a great question, John. I think there's a lot of different things, but the short version would be this. When I was in college, I struggled with depression in a very, very strong way. And I fell into a very deep place in depression. And I remember it got to the point where I found myself feeling completely numb to this entire world. I was mm -hmm. numb to everyone and everything, and I didn't care about anything. And I found out that it stemmed from the fact that I was dealing with this depression and severe anxiety, but I was refusing to acknowledge it. I didn't want to admit that something was wrong because I was afraid about what everyone else might say or might think if I had said that and admitted it. So I tried to cover it up. I tried to bury it. I tried to keep it inside. And when we're dealing with mental health challenges, if we just try to cover it up, it doesn't go away. It lingers, mm -hmm. it stays, and it can morph into deeper and more harmful things, right? So for me, that I was caught up in that in college. And then one day I finally reached out to my mom. Well, I'm so close with my family. I don't know why I didn't reach out earlier. And I remember I let her know what was going on with me. I let her know the dark place I was in and I just talked about it. I just let it all out. And I remember when I did that, maybe about 10 minutes afterwards, for the first time in my life in dealing with these challenges, I realized that I wasn't alone. And I realized that I didn't have to fight this battle by myself. I realized that there was help available and there were people who would support me. Now, I realized not everybody's going to support me. I realized mm -hmm. not everybody's going to love me talking about this, but I know it's important for me. And I found that when I opened up and I started talking about it, I was able to start to learn those proper coping skills and positive strategies that were going to help me to work through it. And that really set the foundation for me creating such a passion to talk about this stuff, to inspire people, give people hope and develop resilience to work through these mental health challenges. And that set the foundation for my business that I've now been in for five years. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, it's 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 a great it's a great story. And so, on your journey now that you've had this business, and you've been traveling around and and speaking. Um, one of the things that somebody told me recently, which uh, which is kind of surprised him. He's a he's a consultant and he does other stuff, right? And he spoke to a large group of people or did some workshops with the company. And he asked them at the end, "What was their biggest <laughs> What was the biggest takeaway? And what what did they get most out of it?" And they said we were seen, we felt seen and heard and understood. And he was like, okay, well, I would have considered that baseline. But the, re but the reality then dawned on him is that, is that people are feeling unseen, they're feeling disconnected, they're not feeling heard. And, and that's, that's often a, a precursor to going down a, a dark path. You're so right. When you're not feeling seen, when you're not feeling validated, when you're not feeling heard, these things make that negative self-talk, as we call it, come out to play in your mind, mm -hmm. which then tells you that you're worthless. You don't matter. You're nothing. You can't do this. You can't do that. You'll never be enough. Right. And when we entertain that negative self-talk time and time again, that turns into us feeling negatively about ourselves. And when we feel those way about ourselves, guess what? Our actions are going to follow that. Because our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions, they're all connected. And it starts with the thought. Okay, And so many times, people may say, I've gone my whole life and didn't see any mental health challenges. But it's something that can form over time through that negative self-talk, through not feeling seen or heard. So I think in today's society, there's a very big push to make a certain type of person seen or heard. And there's, to, there's a very big push in making certain industries more important than others. And what we need to really understand is that you know, you matter, you are enough, you are good, just exactly the way that you are. And there are people who care and who can help and who see you. But sometimes we got to search and find the right paths to connect with those people. Because mm -hmm. if you just go by this mainstream media, you may feel like, oh, my goodness, I don't matter at all. But that doesn't mean that you don't. You need to understand that you just need to find those people, find those areas that do understand you, that you can connect with. So you're not constantly telling yourself, I don't feel seen, I don't feel heard in today's culture and environment. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I think the point about finding the right people is also a really incredibly important one, because sometimes we surround ourselves with the wrong people. And it's not 
entirely their fault. It's our fault because sometimes they're serving a purpose. You know, maybe they're reinforcing what we think about ourselves. And therefore, you know, why would you stay hang around with this person who's always putting you down? Well, if you're already putting yourself down, then they're just validating that for you. So part of the part of the process, and I'm sure you went through this, I think part of the process is that you you know, you have to select the right people to be around you. And sometimes you got to move away from some people. And and as I said, it's not entirely their fault. It's just that in order for you to survive, you have to be surrounded by different people. So true. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't have said it better myself, John. I think I like to call them filters and boundaries. Sometimes we have to put up boundaries with who we allow into our lives. And sometimes with people that are in our lives that maybe we can't escape them, whether it's someone we live with, we're rooming with, or whoever it might be, that's when we want to put up what I call a filter. And so when I say filter, I mean, this person may be saying things or, or bringing a certain environment to you and you may be stuck in that and you feel like you can't leave. But just because you're in an environment, just because someone is saying stuff to you, we have to remember that doesn't mean that you have to allow that into you. You know, in best pay, best case, perfect case scenario, we get out of that environment. We separate from those people. We put up that boundary, right? But in times where we can't, all hope is not lost. That's when we put that filter up, right? And we filter in what we're allowing into our, our internal space, so to speak. We filter what these people are saying, what this environment is saying, and we don't let it control us. We don't let it change us because we stay founded on ourselves and what we believe in, right? And that's really important. So many times we wanna leave that environment, we wanna leave those people, and if we can, that is a perfect remedy. But if you can't, just remember, you still don't have to let that environment in to you and who you are. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And then uh, the, the other thing that I just wanted to ask you about is you mentioned earlier negative self-talk, and that's obviously something, and that afflicts everybody. That's not a uh, that's not an exclusive thing at all. It affects everybody. Uh, how do you start to, or certainly how did you, how do you start to overcome that negative self-talk? Because let's face it, human nature being what it is, we tend to indulge it and uh, we often tend to validate it. Mm, that's a good question. It's one that I get probably almost every time that I speak. Mm. I was speaking at an organization and a business last week and their employees were asking me the same thing. So I think what's really important first is this. We want to recognize it. Now, I know that sounds a little bit underwhelming. Everyone's expecting a magical answer to appear, right? Yeah. But the fact is that if we do not recognize and acknowledge and see this is going on, it's going to steamroll us, right? I always put it this way. A lot of times with this negative self-talk, we go into autopilot mode as humans. We just go about our day. We're not really knowing. And any thoughts that come into our head, we start entertaining, right? And we start entertaining all these negative thoughts and this negative self-talk. And we don't think anything about it because we're just like, oh, well, it's a thought. I can't control that. Uh, Wrong. What we want to do is we want to learn to recognize and pinpoint that thought as soon as it happens. So if you're going throughout your day and maybe you don't do great on an assignment and your boss is kind of salty with you saying, okay, look, no. I'm not worthless. I'm not getting fired. I'm not you know, pathetic. I'm stopping that thought right there. And instead, I'm going to replace that thought. And I'm going to replace that thought with a question saying, okay, just because you didn't do great on this assignment, does that mean that you're automatically a failure in life? Answer, no. So you see what we did there? Simple things such as that. We took that negative thought that was automatic and we stopped it in its trash and we rationalized it by using our rational thinking in that moment. So what we just did in that situation was prevented ourselves from going down that rabbit hole of that negative self-talk. Here we go again to instead keeping our feet present in the moment and planted by counteracting that irrational thought with a rational one. And that process over time is how we learn to beat that negative self-talk and really not be bullied by it anymore. Oh yeah, that well, great say. I love that. I love what you just said there about not being bullied by it, because that's exactly what your negative thoughts are doing for you. They're bullying you, and they're trying to keep you where you are, right? And rather than allow you live your full potential, so I love that idea of like really stopping it in in in, a, in its tracks. Um, and then just in the, in the last moment, uh, um, Scott, uh, what are what are some of other kind of quick. Uh, tactics or tricks that you've learned to just at least try and keep yourself on track? Yeah, there's so many different things, but I think real quick, just for the sake of time, one thing that helps me to keep myself in track is I make sure to throughout the day, take stock, take inventory of what I'm saying to myself. 
because mm -hmm. as, as you know, the day can get so busy with projects and tasks and deadlines and things like that. It can be real easy to just not even think about your own thoughts and what's going on and what you're saying to yourself. So I always make it a point that three times a day when I wake up, during lunch and when I get home from work or whatever it might be, I take assessment of what I've been saying to myself and what I've really been feeling throughout the day. And when I do that, it helps me to recognize when I see some of that negative self-talk and address it and move through it instead of staying in that autopilot mode and being totally, like I said, bullied by it. So taking time throughout the day to recognize how you're thinking and take stock of it and inventory of it, super, super important to stay balanced and, and recognize our mental health and anything else that might be going on. Yeah, that's that's great advice and 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 straightforward, simple advice, which I love. Um, so listen, um, Scott, this has been fantastic. All of Scott's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Yeah, so my business is called Scotty P Inspiration LLC. My tagline is we want to navigate life through the lens of hope. And what I do is I travel around to different schools, different businesses, organizations, any medium necessary. I talk about the importance of mental health, but I also discuss everyday practical strategies that we can use to help us overcome the everyday obstacles that hold us back in life. And I, my advice and the things that I talk about is backed by cognitive behavioral therapy. And for the past five years, I've been working with licensed clinicians and psychology majors to develop this. So this is something that is found that helps me, but also has helped a lot of different people as well. So I'm located in Philadelphia, but I'm national and international. So I've traveled anywhere and you can check out fees and different stuff like that on my website as well. But I'm always open to new opportunities as well. I'm not just to schools or businesses, other opportunities, I'm certainly open to that as well. Fantastic. Well, listen, I encourage people to go check it out because this is a this is an issue uh, and, and a subject that needs a lot more attention to where we get to the point where people treat mental illness the same way as they treat physical illness. It ain't your fault. And it and you need, you know, professional help. And it's just like anything. It's just like any other recovery. Plus, your mind and body are connected anyway. So, you know, as much as you might like to think they're separate, they're not. <laughs> All right, listen, thanks again, Scott. Thank you for watching, listening. I'll see you all again soon.